Hello and welcome to Access Asia. I'm Shah Pegan. In the show this week, we'll show you the human and emotional toll of the devastating earthquake which has rocked southeastern Afghanistan, a natural disaster which has come to compound an ongoing humanitarian crisis. In a quarter of a century under Beijing's thumb, we'll take a look at how the 25th anniversary of the Hong Kong handover is portrayed in the press. And finally, the overwhelming superpower of diversity will meet the young Pakistani-Canadian actress taking on the role of Kamala Khan, one of the first Muslim heroes of the Marvel Universe. Starting in Afghanistan, the earthquake that hit the southeast of the country on the 22nd of June has made immeasurable damage. With over a thousand people killed and tens of thousands now homeless, daily life will be that much harder in a country that was already undergoing a humanitarian crisis following the return of the Taliban to power in August 2021. International aid is trickling in, but longer term help is needed. Our correspondents in the region, Shazai Bwala and Sonia Ghezali, went to one of the areas most hard hit by the quake. This district of the Paktika province was spared by the earthquake. Every day, the locals here send trucks filled with food and blankets to the most affected people living in remote villages approximately 50 kilometers away. <laughs> The aid trucks from local and international organizations have to drive on these bumpy mountainous tracks. They frequently break down. The aid has still not arrived in the worst affected villages like this one. All the houses here have been partially destroyed. In this house, none of the rooms withstood the violent shaking. The survivors of this family now live in the courtyard. They have been traumatized by the frequent aftershocks. The deeper you go into the district, the more devastation you see. This house made out of mud and rock is uninhabitable. These boxes are all that could be saved from the rubble. As the Taliban have called off the search and rescue operation, the arrival and distribution of aid to these remote areas remains the biggest challenge. And this week marks the 25th anniversary of the handover when the People's Republic of China regained sovereignty over the former British colony of Hong Kong. 25 years of which the territory has been further integrated to the mainland in spite of a stated one country, two systems mechanism, especially with a wave of protests in 2019 and the subsequent imposition of a national security law which criminalizes dissent with Beijing. Well, Nicholas Rushworth is with us on set. Hi, Nick. Hi. Well, you're here to give to sort of talk us through some of the ways this particular event is being portrayed in the media. Tell us more. Yeah, we can go straight away to the China 
China Daily for the Beijing point of view. As we're now halfway, aren't we, from 1997, now 2022, we're heading for 2047. The China Daily there with its headline, The 25th Anniversary Heralds a New Era for Hong Kong. And its main message is that the return to the motherland has been largely a success. And in a jaw-dropping line of understatement, Charles, it says that progress has been dogged by challenges, um, which kind of took me away there. One of the quotes is that the central authorities have had to show maximum restraint in exercising their powers over Hong Kong. Uh, now only true patriots can take part in Hong Kong's governance. Of course, we think of John Lee, who's the new chief executive. He's a, uh, a shoe in by Beijing, Beijing's choice. And it's not exactly the same tone that you'll see that we'll be seeing in the Hong Kong Free Press, uh, which covers the pro-democracy movement uh, in the territory. It's using a piece by uh, AFP, in fact, from several days ago, uh, reporting on Chris Patton's criticisms of Beijing rule. Uh, he was the last Hong Kong governor, of course, and he's saying uh, in that headline, you can see it, um, China has ripped up the joint declaration and is vengefully and comprehensively trying to remove the freedoms of Hong Kong because it regards them as a threat to the ability of the Chinese Communist Party to hold on to power. Now, he says that the big changes have come since 2012, 2013 and 2014, when uh, Xi Jinping became what he says is the dictator. Uh, so very strong words there from uh, Chris Patton. Uh, we've, of course, seen huge problems over the last 25 years. Uh, two financial crises, three uh, virus outbreaks, bird flu, SARS and COVID. And then, of course, those street demonstrations. We saw the umbrella revolution, didn't we, in 2014? And then mass protests again in 2019. And one of the signs of the changes in Hong Kong is a move to actually change some school textbooks for the return to school uh, in September. Well, this is something that's happened in the last uh, few weeks with this uh, textbooks, uh, several of them being revised so that uh, they will say that Hong Kong was never a British colony. Uh, Hong Kong, of course, <laughs> as we know, is associated with British colonialism. But Beijing is arguing that historically, at the time under treaties that it had with Britain at the time, they would not accept those treaties. They were unequal and they were not officially recognized. Now, the quote in this piece by the New York Times is that uh, the material is part of a wider campaign by Xi Jinping to overhaul Hong Kong schools and raise loyal patriotic citizens. Definitely not royal patriotic citizens, loyal patriotic citizens. So there you can see the, uh, the revised textbook, one of them anyway, talking about modern citizenship uh, for this one country, two systems, which uh, as we're seeing, we're seeing Hong Kong gradually on its way to 2047, becoming more and more like a Chinese mainland city. Nicholas Rushworth, thank you very much for that press review. Well, in France, you can find them in ham sandwiches, in salads, and in raclette. We consume over 20,000 tons of them every year. I'm talking about gherkins. And this might hurt French people's pride, but over 80% of the pickled goods are actually imported from India. Well, Jenny Shin and our colleagues from France 2 went to meet the Indian producers who've made it their livelihood to satisfy French appetites. It's a staple in French pantries. A whopping 25,000 tons of gherkins are consumed each year in France, and a large majority of them are produced here, in the tropical climates of India. Many brands began outsourcing production of the pickle to India in the year 2000s, where labour is 15 times cheaper than in France, and climate conditions allow for three harvests per year instead of one. Temperatures here never drop below 23 degrees and rarely rise above 30, which is perfect for growing gherkins. In Western countries, cold winters can last for several months. In this factory, all production is destined for abroad. Italy, Spain and the United States. To meet demands of the finest quality goods, they must go through a meticulous process. And here we segregate the smaller size, actually. The smaller size is the most important size for the French market. Also, this is very difficult to produce. Actually, producing a bigger size gherkin is quite easier. After being washed, the gherkins are bathed in vinegar with salts and preservatives, after which they'll set off on a month-long journey to France. 
as per the European Union regulations, we produce all the ingredients, everything. So we send it to Le Havre Airport, and from there it goes to France. Brands who moved production to India say they've been able to reduce costs without compromising quality. Today, India provides more than 80% of these green pickled cucumbers consumed in France. And now let's introduce you to Kamala Khan, the latest Marvel superhero to make her way to the screens on Disney Plus's Miss Marvel. She's sure to wow fans with her body morphing abilities, but also with the fact that she's the first Muslim character to headline her own comic book. Well, the actress who plays her, 19-year-old Pakistani-Canadian Iman Vellani, is breaking barriers of her own and taking on the role, as Delano D'Souza reports. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Iman, you did amazing work. You've done amazing work. It would be honored if you would play uh, Kamala Khan for us in the Miss Marvel show. And it was unanimous decision. Oh, my God. Cast on the last day of high school over Zoom. Karachi-born Iman Vellani grew up surrounded by Marvel Comics in Canada. Now she's making her on-screen debut as Kamala Khan in the six-part Disney Plus series, Miss Marvel. My first proper day of filming, that was intense. It was all the stunts that I had to do in the, the real Captain Marvel suit. There's so many pieces and, and it's just really uncomfortable. <laughs> and the stunts were pretty intense, so I came home with all these bruises and everything. My mom was like, oh my god, what happened? And I'm like, I'm a superhero. That's what happened. Kamala Khan first appeared in Marvel Comics in 2013 as part of the franchise's push for more ethnically diverse characters. The superhero is a second-generation Muslim immigrant who embraces her culture. 19-year-old Vellani says it felt like the Marvel character was referencing her. I saw a girl like me. She was Muslim and Pakistani and a superhero fanatic, and I was Muslim, Pakistani, and a superhero fanatic, so it worked out quite well. And I think my favorite part about the comic books was that it wasn't about her religion or her culture or her ethnicity. It was about a fanfic writing nerd. And it just she just so happened to be Pakistani, and she just so happened to be Muslim. And those parts of her life is what, you know, kind of motivated her and drove her as a character. While Iman Vellani acknowledges her role is monumental, she's hoping that one day people can look up to heroes who look different from themselves. Do you know what you are? And that's it for this week's edition of Access Asia. You can find all previous shows on our website, france24.com, and also in podcast form wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you very much and stay tuned.